uh, everyone, we're just waiting a, another minute or so just to allow everybody to join. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the third Australian population webinar series. So I'm Brian Houle based here at the ANU. Um, and so this series is in place at the APA conference this year since unfortunately we're not all able to come together, but we wanted to have a way to still bring us together to discuss population issues. Um, but I do look forward to seeing everyone at the next conference in, in 2022. Um, to start, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands I meet and pay my respect to the elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge um, all First Nations people joining today. So we're very fortunate today to have um, three speakers and I'd like to thank them from the start um, for their contributions to the, today's session. So we'll go in order. We'll start with uh, Dr. Tom Wilson from the University of Melbourne who will be speaking on local area estimates and geographical patterns of Australia's sexual minority population. Next, we will hear from Aunt Associate Professor Anthony Lyons from La Trobe University, who will speak on making sexual and gender diverse populations count in Australia. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Jamie Veal from the University of Waikato on using evidence from a transgender health survey to inform population measurement. And then after um, each of our panelists have had a chance to speak, we'll have time for question and answer. And I look forward to an engaging discussion with our presenters. Um, please feel free to submit your questions as we're going along. And so there'll be two options to participate. You can either uh, raise your kind of virtual hand in Zoom, and then we can uh, unmute you so that you can ask your question live to the panelists or you can write, write your question on the Q&A function, which is in the bottom kind of Zoom toolbar. Um, and you can do that as we're going along and then I will read those out as we go. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody uh, for the start. And Tom, I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, well, uh, this is work that I've done with Jeremy Temple just recently, looking at um, taking some of our earlier work on national level um, estimates of Australia's sexual minority population and breaking that down to a subnational scale. Um, so the context to this work is the fact that the need for population statistics broken down by sexual identity, so heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and other sexualities is increasingly being recognized by researchers, governments, community organizations, and national statistical offices. Population estimates by sexual identity can help assess demand for a range of services aimed at sexual minority groups, facilitate the monitoring of discrimination and provide denominators for various rates and indicators. Population estimates can also provide data to calculate the number of um, people in sexual minority groups referred to by policy and legislation. And over the last decade in Australia, legislation has been introduced to ban discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, enable marriage equality, and to treat lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people as a special needs group under the Aged Care Act. And for sexual minority populations themselves, being included in statistical reports provides a degree of visibility and allows stereotypes and myths to be countered. And given that population characteristics and needs vary geographically, there's a strong case for creating regional and local area population estimates by sexual identity. So the aims of this work were to one, propose a method for calculating subnational population estimates by sexual identity in Australia, and two, apply the method to produce estimates for um, mid 2016. We chose 2016 because it's the year of the most recent census, um, the year of the most recent finalized ERPs um, that are not subject to later revision. And it's the year that we have important survey data that we need as well. 
So in terms of coverage, we include people identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, and other non-heterosexual identities, and collectively refer to these groups as the, the sexual minority population. And um, we also calculated estimates of the heterosexual population in, in this work. Um, we should point out that our sexual minority estimates are defined in terms of sexual identity, which in practice translates to how people report their sexual orientation in surveys. Now, this will differ from estimates measured in other ways, such as people uh, experiencing same-sex sexual attraction or people engaging in same-sex sexual behavior. And previous research has shown there are substantial differences in population to, uh, size depending on whether the, the definition is identity, attraction, or behavior. Um, so our estimates on identity um, exclude by definition people who, who might experience some uh, same-sex attraction or activity but choose not to identify uh, with a, a sexual minority identity. Um, for this bit of work we uh, got data from four data sources. So first of all we got 2016 census counts of people in same-sex couple relationships uh, from Table Builder and we extracted counts of persons by sex and the broad age groups 18 to 34 35 to 54 and 55 plus by SA3 area, which was about as detailed uh, a disaggregation as we felt we could go um, uh, to ensure that there were non-zero counts in, in most of the cells. Uh, second, we got ABS ERPs for SA3 areas by sex and broad age group. Um, uh, we got third, um, 2016, uh, the national sexual minority population estimates that we calculated in, in an earlier bit of work. And that's just been published in BMC research notes. And finally, we extracted um, some data from HILDA to calculate the ratio of sexual minority individuals in cohabiting relationships to those who are single. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit later on um, exactly how that information was used. So a few equations here. Um, so we, we calculated the uh, population estimates in two main stages. So in the first stage, preliminary estimates of the sexual minority and heterosexual adult populations were created from census counts. So these are preliminary census-based numbers. Um, they're likely to be uh, undercounts, but probably provide a reasonable initial geographical distribution. In the second stage, we scaled those preliminary numbers to be consistent with official SA3 ERPs and on national sexual minority estimates. So um, I'm kind of going backwards a little bit here um, by, by telling you the, the broad uh, uh, um, information first and then drilling down into a bit more detail. So we calculated our census-based estimates as the number of sexual minority individuals in a same-sex relationship, which is the, the cohabiting, uh, same-sex cohabiting population from the census, plus the number of single people who identify as a sexual minority. That's not measured by the census, and we estimate it using additional data and assumptions. So the um, sexual minority single population, um, well, this is assumed to be a function of the proportion of all people in same-sex cohabiting relationships. Um, so it represents a proxy indicator of the attractiveness of a local area to the sexual minority population generally. And that's a key assumption of our approach. So we uh, estimate this as um, the total single population multiplied by the proportion of all partnered individuals in a local area who are in a same-sex relationship, and then multiplied by a scaling ratio to ensure we've got consistency with our national sexual minority single population. And that in turn is estimated like this. So we, we get some information from Hilda on the ratio of people who are in a cohabiting relationship, or, sorry, relationship of people who are single to those in a cohabiting relationship, and multiply that by the, the census count um, of the national sexual minority cohabiting population. And so that gives us our, our national sexual minority single population. And then a, a relatively simple calculation for the heterosexual population, it's the opposite sex cohabiting population and the single population who's not a a section in the sexual minority population. Now, there are various reasons to, to think that these are undercounts. We've got census enumeration, under enumeration. We've got a uh, non-response to the relationship question. And we also miss same-sex couples if one partner is not person one on the census form. 
and we also have um, only census relationship data for persons present at the usual residence in table builder in the stage two of this process we, we take these census-based estimates and we constrain them using iterative proportional fitting to official SA3 ERPs and our national level population estimates by, by sexual identity so that's a fairly simple process so now I'll show you some results so just to describe the, the geography of Australia's sexual minority population, mostly I'll focus on the estimated share of the adult population identifying as a sexual minority. So the shares by SA3 area in 2016 for the female population are shown on this map. So areas with below average percentages are shown in blue, while above average percentages are depicted in the pink, orange, red palette. And as you can see, most of the geographical extent of Australia contains below average sexual minority shares. Um, about a quarter of SA3 areas have above average shares for females, but these are located in the, the geographically smaller um, regions in the, the capital cities. The map for males is fairly similar, though there are more areas with under 1% sexual minority populations. So we need to zoom in a little bit to get a bit more detail. So this is the female population and I'm um, focusing on just the three largest um, metropolitan regions. Melbourne will come in a moment. Um, so in the uh, Sydney region, the highest sexual minority percentages can be found in the inner suburbs um, and also the outer western Sydney region of the Blue Mountains. The highest percentage is in the um, uh, inner city SA3 area of Marrickville, Sydenham and Petersham, uh, followed by the um, Sydney inner region containing the CBD. In southeast Queensland, the inner and northern areas of Brisbane are most attractive to, the, to female sexual minority populations and the highest percentage is uh, Brisbane inner SA3, which um, contains the CBD and, and the, the more gay friendly suburbs of Fortitude Valley, New Farm and, and West End. And if we move to Melbourne, um, again, the, the above average percentages are in the inner and middle ring suburbs, the highest in Darabin South, about 18%. And um, just to the west of Melbourne, that's the um, country town of Dalesford. If we look at the same patterns for the same maps for males, um, uh, it's a broadly similar pattern for males, though slightly more geographically concentrated. And in Sydney, the highest concentrations are in Sydney inner city, which is 36% sexual minority, and also Marrickville, Sydney and Petersham, about 21%. In southeast Queensland, we've got the highest percentage in Brisbane inner, um, although um, we've got uh, many areas between 7 and 15% in um, surrounding areas, and also just to the south in um, Surfers Paradise in the Gold Coast. Uh, for Melbourne, um, we've got um, uh, highest populations in the SA3 areas of Yarra, about 20%, Stonington West, 19%, Port Phillip, 17%, and Melbourne City, about 16%. Um, and these uh, all have quite young populations, which uh, adds to, to um, this geographical concentration. So overall, Australia's sexual minority population is, is concentrated within an overall population distribution that is also quite, quite geographically concentrated. Um, and we calculated a Hoover index of concentration, which is um, one of those classic geography indices. Um, it ranges from naught to 100. So naught is a, a totally even distribution of population and area, and 100 is a maximum concentration. So for sexual minority females, it was 90, and sexual minority ma males, 92. And those are, can be interpreted as a percentage of the population that would have to be redistributed to get an even distribution. For the heterosexual population, it was 86 for both males and females. So it's slightly more concentrated um, than the heterosexual population. Um, we aggregated up our SA3 estimates to various geographies, including the states and territories. Um, not surprisingly, the, the most popular states of New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland have the largest sexual minority populations, while the Northern Territory with just under a quarter of a million people has the smallest. Um, as a percentage of the, the total resident population, uh, New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT have above average percentages um, for males, while for females it's those three states plus the Northern Territory. Um, we also 
aggregated our, our estimates up to remoteness areas. And there's an interesting um, gender difference here. So um, we've got quite a strong um, uh, um, uh, difference between the, the remoteness categories for males. So 4.2% major cities, 1.1% very remote, but much less of a gradient for females. So still very attractive for the major cities, 3.7% uh, in the major cities for sexual minority identity, uh, but 2.6% in very remote areas. Um, just to note a number of limitations of um, our data here. Um, these are approximate estimates based on um, proxy data and various assumptions. And they incorporate survey data, which is subject to sampling and response error. Census data, which only covers a subset of the population and, and has various um, forms of underestimation. Assumptions about the distribution of the sexual minority single population are probably approximate and um, the, the distribution of persons and same-sex cohabiting couples is probably also um, biased to some extent. Um, and there also may be some geographical variation in the likelihood of, of people identifying in the census um, between more socially liberal areas and more conservative regions. And we've also got ERPs which are, are not, not perfect. So uh, some of the key points so we've proposed a method for estimating subnational sexual minority populations, which draws on the strengths of several data sources. Um, we think our estimates provide a reasonable set of statistics on the demography and geography of Australia's sexual minority population. I incorporate national survey data by sexual identity, spatially detailed census data, and importantly are also consistent with ABS ERPs at the SA3 scale and national estimates of the population by sexual identity. And by disaggregating the, the population by sex and broad age group, we incorporated the key demographic influence of um, age structure, age and sex structure on the sexual identity estimates. Um, younger people are much more likely to identify as a sexual minority population. So that's a, a crucial factor to, to um, take into account. Um, so we, we showed that uh, there's a, a lot of geographical concentration of the sexual minority population in the major cities. But it's also important to highlight that there's the presence of sexual minority populations in almost every part of the country. Um, so uh, there are sexual minority populations in outer regional remote and very remote regions, and they're located quite far from uh, specialist support and health services and social opportunities in large cities. And often the social attitudes in some of these remote areas are, are much more conservative those, than those in the large cities. So there's, a, you know, there's an importance there in highlighting um, that, that fact of the the geographical um, distribution of the population. So these are some um, papers that are relevant to uh, this work um, and um, I'd be happy to supply uh, copies of those and I'd like to thank you for listening and I hope I haven't gone over time. Uh, no, thank you, Tom. That was perfect and perfect on time. Um, a very fascinating presentation, so we appreciate that. Um, I'd like to next turn it over to Anthony for your presentation, please. Thanks, Brian, and, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to present today, and, um, and many thanks to everyone who's organized this uh, webinar. So before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people on which I give this presentation today. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So I'm really pleased to be able to share some research and thinking on the topic of making sexual and gender diverse populations count in Australia. Um, I'd just like to first of all acknowledge our project team. So, as Brian mentioned, I'm from the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society, otherwise known as Archers at La Trobe University. Uh, also part of the team is Mary Lou Rasmussen, who is a leading sociologist at ANU, and Edith Gray, who many of you will already know uh, as a leading demographer at ANU. And we also have Joel Anderson, who is a research fellow at Archers. And I'd just like to thank the team for all their great work, some of which I am presenting today. So as some brief background, it is important to first acknowledge the need for 
data on sexual and gender diverse populations. So these populations, such as people who come under the umbrella of LGBTIQ, include people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and many different sexual identities, as well as those who are trans or gender diverse, such as non-binary. Um, and as Tom also mentioned, this population overall experiences a disproportionate burden of challenges related to health and well-being. So these include, among others, disparities in mental health, suicide, um, and also challenges in accessing appropriate services. And recognising these, as well as many other challenges, governments in Australia have often devised strategies and policies to help address these. And many community organisations uh, and service providers have also sought to provide targeted support to people from these populations. However, effectively addressing challenges also requires reliable population level survey data. And this is critical to identifying the specific challenges and needs of different gender, uh, sexual and gender diverse populations and how and where resources can most effectively be targeted. So in this sense, there's not just a need for greater data, but a need for comprehensive data. There are numerous different sexual identities and there's also a range in terms of gender as well as many different experiences of gender, such as people who have a trans history or experience their gender as both male and female or neither. While many population surveys ask about gender and in some instances also sexual identity, how these questions are constructed and the scope of these can shape what is known about sexual and gender diverse populations, or to put it simply, what the population looks like. And this has implications for conclusions that are drawn and the decisions that are made based on data. It's also worth noting that there is potentially a range of issues related to how questions are asked. So these include limits to scope, inclusivity and relevance to participants, depending on whether questions allow them to represent their gender or sexual identity, as well as further issues that could potentially render some populations invisible or force responses that are not applicable. And these are issues we wanted to explore, at least in a preliminary way in our work. So given these potential issues, we decided to set out and examine ways in which gender and sexual identity questions have been asked across different national surveys. And a key objective in this was to highlight approaches used so far and to discuss potential implications for the collection of data. So turning to the methods, we used a qualitative and descriptive focus to explore gender and sexual identity questions. We focused on national surveys due to these often being important sources of population data. And we focused on selecting a limited set of surveys to serve as case examples. So in other words, our intention was not to be exhaustive by examining all surveys, but rather to assemble a fairly diverse set of surveys to serve as examples. And we had four main considerations. First, we examined those conducted in the past 10 years to focus on more recent examples. In addition to surveys that targeted general populations, we also sought to examine several that targeted sexual and gender diverse populations specifically to see how questions might be approached differently depending on the population. We also tried to select surveys that were designed for different purposes, such as those focusing on aspects of health or employment or community participation. Finally, we only looked at surveys that asked sexual identity questions. So almost all surveys have some kind of question related to sex or gender, but we wanted to also examine approaches used for sexual identity questions. So after doing all this, we identified nine national surveys as case examples. This included the Australian Census. It also included four general population surveys. Uh, among this group was the General Social Survey, which broadly seeks information about social characteristics, community participation and wellbeing. Uh, also included was uh, HILDA, um, which Tom has also talked about in his pre presentation. And then the second Australian study of health and relationships, which broadly focuses on sexual and relationship patterns and related topics regarding health. And also the Australian Gen Z or AGZ study, which focuses on a range of experiences of Australian teenagers. And the final four surveys were those that focused specifically on gender and sexual diverse populations. These included Private Lives 2, which covers many aspects of the health and wellbeing of LGBTQ Australians, 
also rainbow aging, which is similar to private lives too, but focuses on older people. And also the Australian Trans and Gender Diverse Sexual Health Survey, which focuses on sexual health among trans and gender diverse populations. And finally, Scrolling Beyond Binaries, which broadly explores how LGBTIQ plus people aged 16 to 35 use digital social media. So turning to some of the observations we made in this analysis and focusing firstly on questions regarding gender, we found that most surveys did not specify whether they're asking for information about either sex or gender. For example, simply asking, are you, and then listing the options. This is an important distinction. It's a fairly complex area that I wouldn't really be able to cover in any great depth today, but most recommendations for these questions make a distinction between sex and gender where sex is generally referred to as the sex that a person is assigned at birth, such as on their birth certificate. But gender is regarded by many as referring to how people actually experience or describe themselves. And this might not align with their sex assigned at birth. So for example, some people may describe themselves as female, although they may have been assigned male at birth, such as people who have a transgender history. So the terms used can be important in how they are interpreted by survey respondents. The only exception to this was the AGZ study, which asked participants to report their gender. And for the most part, the general population surveys only asked whether a person was male or female. However, Hilda also provided an other category. And in contrast to the other surveys, AGZ gave five categories. So these were male, female, trans, intersex, genderqueer, plus additional options for other and don't know. For sexual and gender diverse surveys, all of these referred to gender in the questions and all provided multiple options to select from. However, there was variation in the options provided between surveys. So Private Lives 2, for instance, gave four options. These included male, female, trans, identifying as male, trans, identifying as female, and an additional option that was worded as, I prefer to refer to myself as. Rainbow Aging, on the other hand, gave seven categories. And these were male, female, trans, female or trans woman, trans male or trans man, genderqueer, biqueer and agender, as well as a further option for other. Taking a different approach altogether, the Trans and Gender Diverse Sexual Health Survey provided an open-ended question for participants to self-describe their gender and then results were later coded to form categories. Meanwhile, scrolling beyond bin binaries provided two separate questions. So the first question listed three main categories, male, female, and non-binary, plus a different identity as a further option. And the second asked for gender assigned at birth with two options of male or female. So all up, there was quite a lot of variation in the way questions were posed and structured, even among the sexual and gender diverse surveys. On questions regarding sexual identity, there was also quite a lot of variation in response options in the general population surveys. Um, the census did not ask directly about sexual identity. However, a question on relationships enabled a count of persons and same-sex couples within the same household, something that Tom's also mentioned. Meanwhile, the general social survey gave three categories. These were straight or heterosexual, gay or lesbian, and bisexual, plus further options for other and don't know. And similar to the general social survey, Hilda also gave three main categories of straight or heterosexual, gay or lesbian and bisexual, as well as options for other and unsure. And taking a slightly different approach, Asher II provided four categories. These included heterosexual or straight, homosexual, which was actually asked as gay for those who reported being male, and lesbian for those who reported being female, and then bisexual and queer, plus additional options for something else or other and not sure or undecided. And the AGZ again provided a slightly different set of responses. This survey gave five categories, which were straight or heterosexual, lesbian or homosexual or gay, so as one category, and then bisexual, questioning and queer, plus additional options for something else and don't know. For the sexual and gender diverse surveys, there was likewise variation in response options. So Private Lives 2 provided six categories, uh, including gay, lesbian, queer, bisexual, dyke, heterosexual or straight, as well as a couple of other additional categories for not sure and uh, preferring to refer to themselves as something different. Rainbow aging was somewhat different. This provided seven categories. These were gay, 
lesbian, bisexual, queer, pansexual, asexual, straight, or heterosexual, plus a further option for other. Meanwhile, the Trans and Gender Diverse Sexual Health Survey again provided an open-ended question for participants to self-describe their sexual orientation. And finally, Scrolling Beyond Binaries was somewhat different again to other surveys and provided four categories. These were lesbian or gay, straight or heterosexual, bisexual, and then queer, as well as a further option for different identity. So just to summarize some general observations, um, and turning first to gender, there was no clear differentiation between sex and gender in most of the general population surveys, as I mentioned earlier. For the most part, there was also a lack of multiple options for gender in the general population surveys. And this runs the risk of assuming that everyone who answers male or female are cisgender. Also, while the sexual and gender diverse surveys tended to have more response options, there was still variation in the options available, which could potentially result in different sample compositions. And if the list of main categories provided for gender is limited or does not cover the key categories, there is, there is a risk that those who select other or a different identity may be a relatively large and diverse group and it's not clear what then happens with their data. And on sexual identity, there was wide variation again in the response options across surveys. However, the general population surveys tended to have the shortest range of options for the most part and largely missed a number of identities. All of these except for the census at least gave options for lesbian, gay and bisexual. But there are many other identities and other research, uh, including work that I've conducted that suggests that the numbers of people who identify in different ways is growing and is not an insignificant number. And it might be the case that the variations in response options between surveys overall reflect challenges experienced in identifying an appropriate set of options when designing questions. And there is, of course, potential for people who identify differently to lesbian, gay or bisexual to be made invisible, especially in general population surveys and potentially result in them dropping out of the survey. So I'll finish with a few con concluding thoughts. First of all, this work was exploratory and the aim here was to really help advance the discussion of how gender and sexual identity questions might be further improved in future surveys. We also examine many more aspects of the questions in addition to what I have covered today. Uh, and these are presented in the journal article that we just recently published in Australian Population Studies. But to note firstly, it appears that different approaches are being adopted in the design of gender and sexual identity questions. And this is important to recognize because the ways in which questions are crafted can potentially result in instances where people are forced to respond that may not apply to them or result in them dropping out. And as a result, survey data may not fully reflect sexual and gender diverse populations. Basically, what the population looks like depends largely on how the questions are asked and who answers them. It is worth noting that there have been efforts to standardise questions. For example, the ABS developed a standard for asking questions about sex and gender. And these are great steps and reflect both the challenges and the importance of focusing on how questions are asked. But I think it is important to continue work on improving approaches uh, to these sort of questions. And this is especially needed to ensure the sexual and gender diverse populations are fully represented and fully counted in national and other significant efforts to collect population data. So I'll finish it there and I'd just like to thank you all for joining in on the presentation and webinar today and I hope you found this useful in some way in thinking about some of these issues. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much.